Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. When God looks at me and looks at you, does he disapprove? Many believers wonder in times of difficulty if God really and truly cares. If this is a question you ponder, be assured that his gaze toward you is one of kindness and love. God is ready to pour out his unmerited favor on his children, but it's up to us to receive it. King on scripture, global apostolic leader Robert Henderson shows how accessible the grace of God really is. When you look up with hope, you will find the help you need to overcome hardship, receive from his bounty, live in strength, obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit, extend grace to others, and much, much more. God's grace is abundantly available. Through this new work, you can discover how you can walk in new confidence by trusting your Heavenly Father. You need dwell no longer in doubt, but in goodness and holiness. Robert Henderson is a global apostolic leader who operates in revelation and impartation. His teaching empowers the body of Christ to see the hidden truths of Scripture clearly and then apply them for breakthrough results. He and his wife Mary have six children, a growing number of grandchildren, and living in beautiful Waco, Texas. They're joining us now to talk about his new book, Operating in the Power of God's Grace, Discovered the Secret of Fruitfulness, is Robert Henderson. Robert, so great to see you again. Welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Thank you. It's so awesome to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be with you. You know, this apostolic calling that's on your life as um, having uh, that shepherd's heart for uh, many congregations, organizations, operations around the world, you have an opportunity to give you a unique view into kind of the, um, uh, I consider the pastor of the congregation to be the spiritual doctor. Uh, he, he's to assess what is afflicting the body, uh, diagnose it, and on Sunday write a prescription and deliver it, and hopefully the response is, wow, uh, you must have heard uh, my conversation last night, or you must be reading my mail, or you yes. know, how could you have known that about me? And you know, that's the affirmation we look for when we deliver a message that we're, we're, we're touching where people have that need. In the larger view that you have, you get to see uh, a more of a macro view of the overall body and what the overall body struggles with. And it would seem that the concept of grace would be something so fundamental, so simple, so universally understood and applied that there would be absolutely no need for us to take a deep dive into the concept of grace. But yet, there is that hyper grace that uh, is so extreme. There's that cheap grace which is uh, so minimalized. And what you've done in this new work is I think that you have positioned grace in its equipping. What grace was designed for and how we are to walk in it and to foster it and to nurture it as we would something we planted in a garden. And you use those same metaphors in this book. What was it that you experienced that God put on your heart as you visited? Now you travel, you speak, you're in front of a lot of people. You had to have been getting some word from the Lord, some quickening of the Spirit you were seeing something that first was unsettling because it would be unsettling to me if people didn't understand grace. So what was it that you were seeing that was really the heart of the matter? Yeah, I, I, um, it's, it's quite amazing because I look at some things that we would think because there's been so much teaching on certain subjects that we would understand them. I mean, that the body of Christ would understand them. Uh, even things I grapple with, 
for instance, the faith issue. There's been so much teaching on faith, and yet I still think it's a mystery. I think the same thing is true with grace. I think that that in the midst of all the teaching and all the ideas that have been put out there, and, and many, if not most of them, are good, um, there's still a mystery attached to grace. Uh, and then you add to that the whole present day, what we refer to as the hyper grace movement that is basically removing any sense of responsibility from us as believers uh, toward the Lord, that that uh, everything's been done, I, ha I don't have to do anything else. I mean, I get really, really concerned when I hear state statements like this, that when you were born again, all your sins were forgiven past, present, and future, and you never have to repent again. That greatly dis uh, disturbs me because I do believe that provision was made for my sin, past, present, and future. But my ability to apprehend that provision is connected to my response to God and to my repentance, to my confession, you know, those different things. So I, I think it's not, see, I look at that and I think, okay, this is not just uh, a little problem with a, a um, conflict of doctrine. This, it, it, what's being put out there to me, uh, so often it is putting, if, it, if, if, if what is being said is not true, it is putting souls in jeopardy. And that's what concerns me. That's, it's, that's the level of weight that I think is attached to this because, because it's like, it's like, it's almost made uh, conversion um, um, something that's some kind of a mechanical thing rather than a real encounter with the Lord. And uh, of course, I believe, like uh, I think it's like in, in First Peter, where where Peter said that there would be a grace that would re be revealed to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, and I actually talk about this in the book. Um, and I know that that's talking about His second coming. That there's going to be a there's going to be a, an amazing impartation of grace, another level of grace imparted to us at His second coming. But the principle is still a, a viable, that, at, that it is the revelation of who Jesus is, that intimate awareness of, that, of who he is that actually causes an importation of grace to come. And I wonder sometimes whether the people are actually having that encounter on the level that, that, you know, uh, that I know the, that the Lord would want. You know, this concept you're talking about of one and done. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I uh, come to come to faith and past, present, and future. But that would then discount uh, Jesus' instruction on how we're to pray. Uh, it's a daily uh, forgive my trespasses. Your the last time you were with with us was uh, on your book, The Courts of Heaven, and. This was never something that I had ever heard. Now, I come out of the synagogue, so I had 44 years in the synagogue before uh, coming to faith. And when you made this, when you wrote that book and you presented this case of me standing before God, not in fear and trembling, but to receive my reward uh, to, of what I've done with, which our testimony is not really a matter of I used to be a troll under a bridge, but now. No, what has he done since I came to faith and what, what has occurred during that period of time? Uh, that if I operated in that one and done kind of environment, then I, all I get is the crown. I, I get no jewels and um, Jesus kind of laid it out. He said, you know, in Matthew 5, 17, he said, there'll be those who are great in the kingdom of heaven and those who are going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And if we look at this, we say, well, wait a second. If there's a hierarchy in this new heaven and this new earth, if there's a hierarchy in the heaven as exists today, where do I want to be? Do I want to be front and center, 50-yard line, front row? Or do I want to be in the cheap bleachers where I have to use binoculars and I can't hear a thing going on? 
this kind of puts this, this is the next level. When I understand the playing field, when I understand the adversary, when I understand that the table of my defense is the Holy Spirit, which is telling me exactly what Jesus said when you stand before the judge's man, don't be concerned about what words come from your mouth, but be led by the Holy Spirit. Same thing in the court of heaven as I'm sitting there at the, at the defendant's table, the Holy Spirit saying, don't say a word. I've got this. You just sit there. I'll take care of this. I'll speak. I'll appeal right to the Son, to the Father. Case dismissed, covered. You're out of here. This takes it into an understanding of the why God operates in this court of heaven the way he operates. And I don't know if this was intentional, if this was deliberate on your part, but to me it took it to the next level of now that I have the bigger picture, the court of heaven, and I understand this relationship that's established, now I have my marching orders through operating in the power of God's grace for how to live my life until that day when I stand before the Lord wants to die and then the judgment, uh, but not fearful judgment, but reward, uh, accomplishment, <clears throat> working in a kingdom. So operating in this understanding of grace, which has been defined as, you know, like I said, in the Hebrew, chesed, loving kindness, in uh, the Greek, more of unmerited favor uh, is the common definition. If we are not growing, we're dying. Mm. So if we're not advancing in the kingdom while we are advancing the kingdom, then we're really not being fruitful. And that is an opposition to God's word. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the subtitle to the book is Keys to Fruitfulness. And and of course, I meet a lot of people, you were talking about this macro view of the body of Christ. I meet a lot of people that feel like they're just not measuring up. Um, they, they feel like they're, that there's there's something about their life that's never fulfilled what they were, they were put here for. In fact, I don't meet just some people, that's the majority of people in the body of Christ. I mean, I'll, I'll say literally in some of my teachings and seminars, how many of you feel like you've not been able to fulfill what you were actually put here for? And every hand in the room will go up, every hand. Uh, of course, we're still alive and living, and so we still got things to do, but but there's, there's a frustration in the people. And I came to realize that, that grace, that if we can determine what we are graced to do, uh, because all of us, the Bible speaks about it First, First Peter 4.10. It talks about the many faceted grace of God. In other words, grace has a lot of different flavors, a lot of different colors, a lot of different realms. In fact, Paul said the gift he had, gifts he had, was determined by the grace he had received. And so, um, and you know, there's some pretty, pretty significant discussions that we can have about that. But the bottom line is most people have not been able to discover what they were graced for. And so as a result, they may be laboring in an area that they were never intended to actually labor in, so therefore they're not able to bear their fruit. And just being able to determine, okay, this is what I was put here for, and I know it is because I am graced in that area, then all of a sudden fruitfulness starts to come. And that one little piece can really help change people's lives so that they get a sense of fulfillment and what you're talking about, um, they actually have rewards. We, we will have rewards in the life to come because we have given our life to the purposes for what we were put here. When you look at grace and we connect it to gifts and uh, we know that each one of us is endowed with certain spiritual gifts, there's many tools out there to help you identify them. But I've always said that if, if you have a gift of hospitality and I park you in the back room to count the offering and remove you from everybody, pretty soon you're going to be unhappy. You're going to start to criticize the church. You're going to start criticizing because you're not using your gifts. Therefore, you don't feel fulfilled. So part of our fulfillment 
is operating in the gifts given us to by the grace of God. And if we don't know who we are, uh, we can become our own impediment. And you make that very clear. As a matter of fact, in early on in the book, you lay out five very specific areas of blockage, of, of how we handicap ourselves uh, in not being able to not only bear fruit, uh, but uh, put ourselves in position to bear more fruit if we are fruit bearers. Because God's, it, it's not that God is a dissatisfied God. He just knows that you're capable of more so if you're bearing fruit for the kingdom, he's going to cut you back just like we cut back the vine uh, so it'll bear more fruit. And it doesn't feel good, but yet it's a process that brings new growth. How do we look, look at this? And, and, and I, I, uh, I think that um, uh, this idea of purpose... Um, I, I, w I would say that there's probably more people that are more conversant in the purpose-driven life than they are in the text of Scripture. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's a compliment. It's, a, it's like a left-handed compliment. It's, uh, you know, I, w I would much rather have them more well-versed in Scripture. Uh, but uh, from a Jewish perspective, uh, uh, our name Jew, Yehudi, Yehudim, uh, worshipers of God. We were created to be worshipers of God. In the engrafting of the Gentiles into this, now we have a new man that God is now pouring out grace on this new unity, and the kingdom is now being exponentially grown because you take a small group of, uh, we're 14 million out of 7 billion, uh, that's, that's not really a kingdom. You know, that's a nation. Okay? Mm -hmm. But when you add the two and a half billion believers to the 14 million Jews, now you have a third of the world. Now you've got something that's going to make its mark if it's operating in this area. So if we're supposed to bear fruit, and fruit is a product of the gifting, and the gifting is a product of grace, then how does all this sequentially, mm -hmm. you know, we come to faith. What, when, when are the gifts mm -hmm. given? How do we know what the gifts are? And what are the things that we do to actually block that process? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. You know, I just, just, just today I put on Facebook, I said, I said, grace is not just a remedy for sin. Grace is the empowerment to empower us past our own human limitations. Because, because so many people think that grace is just what I get saved by, like Ephesians 2.10, which is a powerful scripture. We're, we're saved by grace uh, uh, and not of our own works does any man should boast. And so that's a powerful thought. But but I like someone came to me and they said, this is the best book I've ever read. And I was like, really? And because their whole concept of grace was, well, that's just what gets me to heaven and put it limited, it, limited it on to that level so that there was never the ability to to be empowered in the in giftings and abilities uh, out of the supernatural realm of God. So having said that, I believe, for instance, Second Timothy one nine, Paul said to Timothy, he said that they were called according to the purpose and the grace which was given to them before time began. That is such a powerful statement that something was released to us before we ever existed in the earth that God is waiting for us to discover. And that's purpose and grace. And I tell people, I say, you will know you have discovered your purpose because of the grace attached to it. And, and I said, because whatever your purpose is, the, there will be grace that is connected to that for you to for you to fulfill that purpose. And so many people, again, are trying to do things outside of their purpose. And then I give them, I think I probably put this in a book, I give them five distinct ways to recognize that they've discovered purpose that has grace. And, you know, I talk about, I mean, it, it's really like simple stuff. I talk about, number one, you'll enjoy it. I mean, 
if you're really graced to do something, it's not drudgery to you. It's life to you. Everybody's so afraid that God's going to call them to do something they're going to hate. And that he's going to send them across, you know, to the backside of Africa somewhere, and they're going to have to live in poverty. Well, the truth is, is if, if if he did, that would mean they were called there, and there would be a grace, and they would find great life. Uh, and so I say, you know, God will never do that. In fact, should he call you, I like, like for instance, this happened to me. Should he call you to something that you don't think you want to do? Ephesians or Philippians two says he works in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. See, that's what he did with me. He actually changed my heart so that I then began to desire the very thing that he had called me to and that he had graced me to do. Because I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be in ministry. I didn't want to be, you know, do the whole thing. I'd grown up in church, all that kind of thing. I had no interest in it and uh, had kind of lost interest in it. But the bottom line is, God in, a, God in his graciousness changed my heart so that I began to desire the very things that he wanted me to do. And, and that began, and so when I began to do them, there was great enjoyment with it. There was great excitement connected to it. And that's just one of the things that grace does. And um, uh, so there's, you know, he, he causes us to enjoy it. I tell people, I said, second thing is he'll, he will, um, he'll cause you to be um, good at it. You'll discover you have gifts. You'll have gifts. Then you'll be successful at it. I said, you know, it may be a process, but if you're really graced to do something, there'll be success connected to it. I said, number four, you'll actually be able to make money doing it. And that shocks a lot of people because whatever you're graced to do, there is, there. I mean, and, and because so many people fence, uh, spend their entire life doing something they hate to make a living. It's because they never really discover what they were graced to do. Because I believe that, that whatever your grace to do, there there is a way for somebody to make a living out of that. Now now we're not talking just about church stuff. Right. You know, now we're talking about something way past that, about how we function in everyday life. And then the fifth thing was there'll be people that will bear witness. The right people, I say the right people will bear witness. Um, not everybody will. Uh, you'll always have the naysayers and the enemies, but there will be those that are strategic that God will put in your path that will that will say yes that you've been graced to do this and they will encourage you in your efforts and your and what you're going after. You bring up so, uh, so many interesting points there in relationship to grace that really should make a uh, an incredible connection for people to understand that the product of grace is gift. Mm. That's yes. the, the so not just salvation, okay? And when you think in 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 terms of it, if salvation was the end all and be all, if that was the end point, we'd just be taken up the moment we said <laughs> yes to the Lord. So why do we stay here? What what are we supposed to do in the years we wait to be graduated to heaven? Well, that's where God equips us with certain gifts. And each one of us, uh, according to Paul, not everybody can be this, not everybody can be that. But he also gives us an admonition that says that just because this is what you have, you shouldn't not seek after the higher, the higher things. So... Yes complacency sets in. I, I get myself, and I've been doing the same thing and operating the same way for 40 or 50 years. And so um, they call them the steady eddies. You know, the steady eddie. Boy, you can count on him, but it's just on a, on a linear basis. There is no growth. Uh, there's, no in, there's no real increase. There's just, you know, he's, he's, gonna be, he's always going to be on the mission team. He's always going to be uh, he's going to be the treasurer, no matter what year in year out. But that's not growth. That's mm -hmm. that's not that's that's actually kind of brings up the question: um, Should we be doing more discipleship, more mentoring, more more of grace applied and? Um, almost instead of doing a spiritual gifts inventory, mm -hmm. uh, link that to a grace inventory 
Look at the five things you just said. Uh, do people confirm that in you? Are you happy in it? Are you, are you able to make a living at it? Is this something that brings you great joy? Then take a look at the gifts and see how to further advance. And I think that that is the power that you bring out in the book of God's grace is that he's the God of more. Yes. You know, so when we say things like statements we use, grace, grace, and more grace, that uh, equates to gifts, gifts, and more gifts. Uh, and that's going to elevate you in the kingdom, not to the point of being a, uh, I forget the term that you used in the book of a, um, uh, there was an expression you used in the book I hadn't heard before, not a tall read, but... Um, oh, oh, um, uh, tall poppy. Tall poppy, right. Yes. Right, not for the point of puffing up. Yes. All right, but a point of being more effective and more uh, influential mm -hmm. in the kingdom. Not, not to be a Pharisee that get the best seat, uh, but uh, to be able to uh, use for the kingdom to yield a return. Uh, gifts have to, in, in God's economy, there, there needs to be a return on the investment that God has made in you, and we sometimes squander that. One of the points you make that I think is essential is you have to be in a position to receive. So many people define themselves as, how many people are givers? Wow, everybody's hand goes up. How many people are, are uncomfortable receiving? And lots of hands go up. But the biggest gift you ever received was salvation, and you did absolutely nothing for it. So you must be pretty good at receiving if you receive that gift of salvation. In order to operate fully in the power of God's grace and bear fruit. How important is it that we have this attitude of hineni, here am I, send me? Huh. Yes, yes, that, that absolutely, you know, that, of course, that's what Abraham, I, I'm amazed, because I, I think I write this in the book, I'm amazed uh, at Abraham's response, for instance, when God said, Abraham called his name, he said, here am I. Uh, I mean, he didn't ask God, he didn't say, what do you want? <laughs> he didn't, he didn't he, in other words, the statement, here am I, it seems to imply whatever you want. I don't know what you're going to tell me. I don't know what you're going to ask me to do, uh, but whatever it is, I'm going to do it. I, that, that's already a settled issue in my life. And of course, I think that's what made Abraham so so great and God could use him so powerfully. But but it, it's the same, it, it's the same. You, you see that phrase, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Uh, you see that that ability just to yield and to surrender. And of course, I think, I think that that is probably one of our greatest challenges is just being able to surrender and just say, Lord, because I tell people, God's not asking for our strength. He actually delights in our weakness. And because th then he can come and he can pour that grace in uh, upon us that does bring the empowerment. That's what, the Paul's, that's what Paul said. He said, I was with you in fear and trembling. Uh, and yet, he said, uh, he said, I was there in the demonstration of the power uh, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. But he understood that that, that, that flowed out of, um, out of a weakness that he had, where he had no confidence in the flesh, but only in who and what he was by the grace of God. And that's what he said on a consistent basis. I am what I am by the grace of God. I tell people, you know, when the elders in um, Revelation, when they, they hear the, the, the four living creatures saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, they fall off of their thrones that God, they've been granted onto their face. They take the crowns that they have been given. Obviously, they've, they've, they've won those crowns, they've overcome, and they cast them before the Lord's feet, saying, worthy is the Lamb. And I said, that act, what that act says to me, that act says the only reason we have these crowns and the only reason we've been granted these positions is because of your grace. 
Yeah, yes, we did obey, but our obedience flowed out of the strength of your grace. Yes, we did function, but we functioned out of the strength of your grace. When you boil it down, we said yes, we did, we did surrender, we did yield, but anything that happened of any goodness, it came out of who you are in us. And of course, I think the, the Apostle Paul said the same thing when he said, he said, no, no good thing dwells in my flesh. He said, nothing good dwells in my flesh. Uh, and, 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 and people, some people would take that and say, oh, see, you got to understand, you need a good self-image, you know, and I agree with that. We do need a good self-image in regards to who we are in, in the Lord, who we are in Jesus. But, but Paul said outside of that, he said, nothing good dwelled in me. And he, and he understood that, that any worth that he had was a result of who Jesus was within him and what he had done. And to me, that gives me the right perspective uh, on living life out of the grace of God, strengthened by the grace of God, and positions me to be able to receive more fully from the Lord uh, and be empowered out of it. Because I agree with you. I do agree that the primary thing that we do receive from grace is gifting. Um, and, uh, and, of course, in the book, I talk about the three categories of gifting that Paul spoke about uh, in the New Testament. And, um, and, and those are quite amazing when you start looking at the different words associated with, with that. And, that, and that's a, a great segue into taking a break. One of the points I wanted to make with you was as we see those angels remove that crown, it takes me back to the Garden of Eden when uh, God made the first sacrifice and he clothed Adam and Eve with a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. We go to the book of Revelation and they're now removing this crown, which is mm. kind of representative of this garment of salvation, this robe of righteousness, and saying, before you, O Lord, I, I, I come to you naked and afraid, but not in fear, but uh, now I know your majesty, I'm in your presence. And the script from Isaiah 6, where the very same seraphim are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory, are now declaring, holy, holy, holy is Lord God of hosts, who was and is and is to come. And same setting, same throne, same majestic view. And most of us operate in the Isaiah 1 through 5 realm and don't get to the Isaiah 6. When we get into the presence of God, we're so humbled, we realize that we are of unclean lips and we can confess. And that's where that one and done doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if it was one and done, I never can get myself into Isaiah 6 where I can be at that throne and be so overcome that I realize that unless the Lord and the Holy Spirit are the ones anointed in my mouth, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are not acceptable to God, only that which is spoken through yes. the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So that, that, that we, we have to get to that point of past, that one and done. As a new believer, you're not ready for that encounter. You've got to be seasoned in mm -hmm. the Lord. You have, to, you have to make that journey, knock on that door many, many, many times, many times mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus before that door swings open and you're there in that Isaiah 6 moment. It's a, it, it, it's a profound picture you've painted. We're talking with Robert Henderson, operating, I'm sorry, <laughs> about his new book, Operating in the Power of God's Grace, Discover the Secret of Fruitfulness. We have looked at grace as unmerited favor and applied it in a universal term that talks about saved by grace and not by works. Uh, we, we have kind of pigeonholed grace into an area that it's an overarching of everything, but when we examine, there's a product of grace, and that's gifting. Yeah. And in that gifting is the equipping that God has predetermined what he's going to assign you with, and you now have to put yourself in a position to receive. It's like a football team. Uh, if, you're, if the ball is passed to you, you've got to get yourself clear to be able to 
receive. And there are going to be obstacles in the way, but you got to get yourself clear of that defender so you can receive. And once you receive, then God's going to clear the path for you to produce fruit for the kingdom, to have a more enriched life, and even in that process will be a pruning and a cutting back and maybe a removing from one setting into another setting which doesn't feel like or seem like it's a promotion. But God's in the promotion business. You think it's a lateral move, even a punishment, but then he opens up a whole world for you if you've been faithful in the little things that he's given you. He makes you master over much. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about where we left off with Robert Henderson about operating in the power of God's grace. We'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Robert Henderson, author of the new book, Operating in the Power of God's Grace, Discover the Secret of Fruitfulness. Robert, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So good to be with you. Robert, before we went to break, you mentioned three things you wanted to share uh, that uh, you outline in the book uh, that our audience needs to be aware of, those three things. Well, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote about giftings, uh, that in his writings, they were all considered giftings of grace. Uh, he put he put uh, them in three categories. He in Revelation, or excuse me, Romans twelve, 
the charismata gifts, uh, where that uh, there's seven of them mentioned there. And those gifts are primarily, in my opinion, um, what we, uh, realms of grace we're born with. Uh, for instance, it says, again, in First or Second Timothy 1, 9, that purpose and grace was already given to us before time began. I believe the grace that was given to us uh, are these are these uh, uh, seven giftings, or or one of these giftings? One of these giftings will, will dominate each person's life. Uh, the gift of mercy, the gift of prophecy, the gift of leadership, the gift, uh, you know, the, the different giftings that are mentioned there. The the, the uh, each one of them, and it, it's um, people will see through. It'll be like glasses that they wear. They'll see through our life through those lenses, if you will. For instance, my wife tends to be very prophetic. Uh, what that means is that, is that she doesn't run around prophesying, but she's very black and white. And she's very justice oriented. And that and prophetic people tend to be that way. They're right. as far as that they're justice oriented. Uh, uh, people jokingly say that Mary's Mary's mo uh, uh, mantra for life is evil people must die. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, but that's that's just, I'm I'm not that. I I I do you know desire justice. Obviously, just as a believer, uh, I want right things done. I can get upset over things we see happening that are unjust, but that's not the driving force of my life. Um, I would tend to probably, well, I, I, pro I probably tend to carry a leadership uh, gifting uh, as far as the one that would tend to dominate my life. And so when people just discover that one area, that helps them a lot because they begin to realize, oh, wait, I was graced for that. Uh, I need to I need to plug into life out of that gifting that I've already received, and and this and the truth about this is that this is true for believers and non-believers. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you get when you get saved. You've already got this because it was it was appointed to you as a human being before time began. So you're born into the earth, if you will, carrying one of these seven realms. Of, of grace that are mentioned there in Romans 12. So that's the first category. And then the other two are the um, first, are, well, the Doma gifts out of Ephesians chapter 4, where he talks about apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And even though we know these are fivefold ministry gifts, I believe that, that every person uh, will have, will, will tend to gravitate toward one of those realms. And I talk about in the book how that can even be applied in the business world, that the apostle would be more of an, a CEO, a prophet uh, would be more of those people that can see into the future so that, that they can actually take the company where it needs to go uh, because they can perceive where the market's going. For instance, I, I'll never forget, you know, I grew up I grew up with Timex. I grew up as a kid. You know, Timex, watch it, takes a lick and keeps on ticking. You right. know, I re I'll still remember that tag. But then they didn't transition when, when you know, the whole LED stuff came out, the watches, stuff. they didn't transition. They thought it was a passing fad. And they didn't have a profit, if you will, in their company that could foresee where the market was going. And so now they have a very, very small share of the market. Uh, they're in, you know, I mean, the watchmakers of Switzerland and all these kinds of things because they didn't have that prophetic element operating in their company. So I'm just, the whole point is, is that it's not just limited to the church world. Uh, these giftings can operate, and many people have fit. For instance, I believe um, that an evangelist is in the in the work world is a uh, is a very good salesman. They know how to reach people. Uh, uh, they they know how to market things. They know how to package things up so that people want to. Uh, I believe uh, you know teaching is it is that it keeps people equipped in the company. And then pastors are are um, a customer service people that know how to make people meet their needs. Know how to make people feel important. All these kind of things. So so you find that in the that the people fit into one of those categories. And then the other ones are the twelve manifestations of the spirit of first corinthians or excuse me nine uh manifestations of the spirit in first corinthians 12 and all those that can operate supernaturally uh out of our lives as well but all of it are gifts of grace all of it and it is quite interesting to see how you take the charismatic gifts the doma gifts the phanerosis gifts which are the manifestation and you see how 
as individuals, how those all can mix together and make us very unique people, but it's all based out of the grace of God. It's, you know, it's interesting. I spent 35 years in the corporate world, and for a period of time, I was a product evangelist. That was my, wow. that was my title. I was a product evangelist. Um, and um, uh, never gave it another thought until just now. Is yeah. You reminded me of that, because when the... When the I came out of IT, and so when software began to evolve and new products were being introduced, email was revolutionary. Uh, I was a product evangelist uh, for those kind of products, and so uh, it, it it those gifts do apply, uh, and. Uh, God uses uh, in the marketplace and in the congregation. Uh, you talk about leadership, and I think that's, that's uh, um, leadership, headship, uh, modeling, uh, helping people develop in their gifts. It's part of the, uh, I see the purpose of this book is to kind of reframe uh, this idea of gifting. And uh, you know, lots of books are written about spiritual gifts, breaking them down, uh, analyzing each one, uh, coming up with a spiritual gifts inventory and figuring out. Uh, I actually took one of those and it was equal numbers for preaching, teaching, and administration. So all those three. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was what prospered in ministry was that I could preach and I could teach and I could uh, put together an organization and, and, mm -hmm. and minister it. So it, God used that because that's what he had called me to do in that season. The things we do in our life that trip ourselves up, uh, how much of our past uh, we, we deal a lot in the area of uh, sin response uh, most often is steeped in a shame mm -hmm. kind of base. Somebody shamed you, uh, molested you, uh, hurt you badly by something they spoke. Uh, how much of that is an impediment to really receiving First, the grace of God, not attached to a gift, but just the simple grace of God that you are enough. Meaning that whatever, wherever you are, God loves you. Yes. And God accepts you. He wants more for you, and if you will surrender, he'll develop in you and allow people to come into your life to develop. But... God does not make in his image, we're, we're all in the same image. Mm -hmm. So in that creation is something that is beautiful and wonderfully created to him. Uh, how do we restore people's, I guess, uh, attitude towards what does God really think of me? Yeah, that's so that's so so good because because like when Noah, as as we all know the story of Noah, how that he was commissioned by God to build an ark because he understood the flood was coming. Of course, it never rained. You know what's God saying here? But but the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And I I tell people I was reading that one day and I suddenly realized okay you could interpret that as uh, God just decided to favor Noah, or is it saying that Noah actually looked into God's eyes, quote unquote, and saw the gracious gaze of God toward him? And that, I believe, regardless of what it's saying, I believe that that is one of the ideas that the Bible is communicating, that Noah saw God's favor, his grace toward him. And it's quite interesting that because he was able to see the grace that was in God's eyes toward him, that he and his family were saved. Because our perspective of God does determine whether we get saved or not. 
I mean, because because if I think God's against me, um, then that discourages me from even approaching him. But if I know that his gaze toward me is one of love and, and favor and acceptance, no shame, no condemnation, then it, it, it draws me. I always think about Jesus when he when when the Bible says the rooster crowed and and as Peter had denied him three times, and the Bible says that Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And you would say, well, you know, in the natural, what Jesus must have done, the, you, I can't believe you failed me. I can't believe you did that thing. But see, we know that that wasn't the gaze of Jesus. Jesus was looking, and as he looked at Peter, it, his gaze was full of forgiveness. His gaze was full of, of kindness toward him, and it broke Peter's heart. It broke, he went out and he wept bitterly because it, it wasn't the condemnation of the Lord. It was the love and the acceptance in the midst of Peter's failure that broke his heart. And, of course, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And it's the love of God that actually brings us and draws us to him. And it's the goodness of God that brings men to salvation and brings men to repentance. The other one thing I would just mention is that I am amazed at the story of the prodigal son because in Luke 15, because the son, whenever he gets up out of the pig pen, the scripture says that that he he practices his speech. That he's going to go home and say to dad, Lord, or to dad, uh, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he has his whole speech prepared. And then when you when he finally gets to the home, the father actually in, in, interrupts it. And, and it says, bring out the robe. And that word robe, it literally means he, he was clothed with dignity, with dignity. And, and so one of the things that happened was the prodigal son went back to ask for mercy, but God instead gave him grace because there's a difference between mercy and grace. Yes. The son was going to ask for mercy, but the father gave him grace instead. Well, it's always been God's desire to be with us, to walk with us. He did that in the garden with Adam. Yes. And then we see again, he did it with Enoch for 365 years. Wow. Very short. You know, Enoch walked, walked with God and he was no more. But Enoch lived 365 years. Wow. And it's kind of like a revisit to, I'm going to show you again what I want to do is I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. All right, you, you sinned in the garden, but here's Enoch. I got him set apart. I'm going to walk with him 365 years. Yes. I'm going to walk with him, and then he's going to be no more. This is God's desire is to be in a personal relationship with us, to receive his grace, and his grace does come gift-wrapped like a present. Amen. And these are exactly what will bear fruit in our life. We've been yeah. talking with Robert Henderson about operating in the power of God's grace. Discover the secret of fruitfulness. If you'll visit ignitinganation.com and click on today's broadcast schedule, you'll see the name Robert Henderson. You're going to see a little line that says, like the interview, get the book. Click yeah. on get the book. It'll take you right to get a copy for yourself. It will change your perspective and understanding not only of the concept of grace, but it will also change your walk with the Lord if you'll receive the message contained in these pages. Robert Henderson, always a pleasure to have you. Always glad to see your face and have you on the program. You always leave us wanting more. Thank you, Rabbi. That's, that's a great compliment. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take you. a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.